Also, I should probably be checking the chat. All right. All right, so let's do this with R. I'm gonna open up the RMD that I prepared. So how do you go about solving a simple system of linear equations or even a complex one is you define your matrix like so. So what I like to do just to keep things organized is every single time I do a row, I skip a line. And then you put that in like C and then you close that and then what you have to do, and I don't know why you have to do this, is you have to specify the number of rows and the number of columns respectively. So we have a three by three. I know this looks like a four, a three by four, but when we mean matrix, we really just mean the coefficient matrix. So that is why it is a three by three, All right? And then B is the other vector of solutions. So then just to make sure that you've inputted it correctly, you can check A and you can check D. That looks good. And then the way you solve it is you call solve on A comma B. And I found on Stack Overflow that perhaps with bigger systems, you might consider doing this instead of solve comma B. So I haven't played around with it, um, but let me know if you ever use it and what you find. Um, so you can also try out other matrices, but you might get a message that's puzzling and that's because some systems are considered inconsistent in the sense that they have no solutions. So if you get a weird output um, or I think it's not even a weird output, I'm sorry, like R is very explicit about it being inconsistent and it will tell you that it has no solutions. So although the motivating example here is, um, is old, I mean, this is still really relevant. You can construct systems of linear equations for lots and lots of problems, including you know, what, we, what we might be doing regularly every day. So it's, it's something that came up actually very recently uh, when I took this decision modeling course. Um, I thought I was done with linear algebra when I took the class, but these things just keep coming back. Because um, in decision modeling, we use a lot of transition matrices to model sort of like the transition of someone in a particular health state to another health state. So all of this stuff is still relevant and cool. And it's nice to see that R has lots of helpful and, and really quick commands to help you solve these. So let's go over some pretty simple stuff, but it helps to get reacquainted with uh, the terms. So this, this is actually an array, but it's rectangular or it can be square and it's called a matrix. And again, it has three rows by three columns. I already touched on that because um, when it comes to defining how many rows and columns, all we really care about is the coefficient matrix. So another method that's really helpful when you do have more complex systems is to try to get it to what's called a row reduced form, aka an augmented matrix. Well, first you do an augmented matrix and then eventually after a few set of calculations, you get to a row reduced form. But this is basically taking this and just omitting the X1, X2s and X3s in order to just make it more readable. And also it makes it better if you want to import it into MATLAB or R, um, you're less likely to make mistakes if it's neatly presented like this. 
and the equals here get substituted by like dash minus. So with a system like this, the steps are sort of the same in terms of trying to reduce it to a form where you have like your unknowns on one side and then your result on the other side and you try to find like one unknown and then you back substitute. But there are some rules about this that make your life way easier. And so you should perform these operations in such a way that you fulfill these three properties. So the first property is the leading coefficient in each equation should be one. The second is the leading variable in each equation does not appear in any other equation. And then the last one is the leading variables appear in the natural order with increasing indices as we go down the system. So when I was first taking the class, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, we just went over a method that works. Can't we just like repeat it? But this is actually really valuable to follow in order to solve more complicated systems. So again, it's a lot of steps, very tedious, but you know, this, this got a name and it's even considered an algorithm and it's called the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So you keep going with these elementary operations until you fulfill all three properties. And although it's called Gauss-Jordan elimination, this is the same stuff that Chinese mathematicians were doing way back in the day. <laughs> so nice piece of history there. So at the end, you know, you get a system that satisfies those properties. So the first non-zero number in each row is the leading variable and they're all ones, that's good. And then we don't, we have them kind of in, the, in their natural order of appearance. So for example, if like this one was instead like over here, that would be bad news. That would mean we're violating property number two. And so this is, this is the benefit of going through the Gauss-Jordan elimination or to get it into a real reduced form is that then it becomes really simple in terms of thinking about solutions for this system of equations, right? Because we can see from this that we're gonna have infinitely many solutions um, given values of T and R. So if you were doing this on pen and paper, this would have probably taken, I don't know, 10-ish minutes if you're unexperienced and haven't done much linear algebra in the past. I know I was getting quicker with them during the class, but um, R could do this for you. They can get it to this form and you can use the Pragma package to do so. So this is the same matrix that was in the slides. And when you call upon RREF, which is row reduced form, it gives you that same cleaned up matrix that fulfills all three properties. And this could save you a lot of steps, but also make sure that your work is correct. So I just had to admit someone else. Okay. Okay, so you can express linear systems in matrix form. We kind of saw that a little bit, but this is just more of how you would do so. And then I know that Adam went through dot products, um, but here's a quick little refresher on 
how to multiply a matrix, A, for example, that is a two by three by a vector that's three by one. So if you kind of follow the math here, it's like one times three, two times one, three times two, and you add those up. And then you go on to the second row, one times three, zero times one, minus one times two, and then you add those up. And sometimes if you forget like the order of the arrows or how they should go, a neat little trick is figuring out what your result will look like. So we went from a matrix that's like two by three and a vector to a vector that's two by one. How did we know, or how can we know that it's gonna be a two by one? Well, this has to do with a neat little property of matrix algebra. And it's the following. The product AX is defined only if the number of columns of matrix A matches the number of components of vector X. And the result will be an N by one. That's exactly what we see here. Right, the N of this matrix is two. Therefore, two rows by one. So hopefully that's clear. And with that, what do you guys think about this? Would it be defined or no? Anyone could speak up. Yeah. Right, it wouldn't be, yeah. Uh, there's another important rule regarding matrix, the matrix product of two matrices. So similarly, we need to make sure that the components match in a specific way in order for the result to be defined, aka the result to actually exist. Um, and a rule that I like to go by to kind of remember it all is like if you follow the color coding here, like the insides need to match for something to be defined and the result will be like the outsides. So like the, in order for it to be defined, P and Q need to be the same. And then for predicting the result, like the, the structure of it all, it's going to be an N by M matrix. So here, unfortunately, the example is not very illustrative of this because it's they're both the exact same structure. They're both two by two, but um, again, the arrows I thought were helpful in this diagram in case uh, you forget how to multiply and add things up to get the result. All right, cool. So, so far, um, some very foundational things about matrices and vectors and how their dot products work. And we can jump into eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and singular value decomposition. These are slightly more complicated, if not a lot more complicated, depending. Um, but these things are really cool because they have applications in so many things that we do without maybe realizing it. So this is gonna get a little mathy. I'm sorry, I'm lifting this from the textbook, but I think these are good as a reference, and I'll, I'll go through these things um, in a more intuitive way. But basically, if we want to know if something is an eigenvector or an eigenvalue, is it will fulfill this result. So you take A, a matrix A, you multiply it by a vector, and then it should equal to that vector um, 
dotted by a scalar multiple. A scalar multiple just means like a scalar value, like two, three, minus one, minus five. And then if you're more visually inclined, this is the kind of intuition for eigenvalues and how they work. And there's actually really great videos to help you build intuition about these things that I highly recommend. It's from a YouTuber called Three Blue One Brown or something. Am I getting that right? <laughs> Can someone please find the video on um, YouTube? I completely forgot about it, but it would be nice um, if people had that in case they were interested in these videos. They're very casual and they're not mathy at all, but they do the trick. All right, so I have an example here that I've written out because it's just too hard to type it. Um, but let's imagine we have this A matrix, two by two, and we have V1 and V2. These are given to us. We didn't try to find them or anything. And we know this result based on the mathy slide before that if we have a dotted by V equaling the scalar multiple dotted by V, then we know that lambda is an eigenvalue and V is indeed an eigenvector. So this is pretty simple matrix algebra, given that we kind of looked at the rules of how those work and the, the directions of the arrows. And so we can verify this for both V1 and V2. So to verify it, you just take a V1 and you see what you get. And again, this is what I would do on my tests for when I, whenever I was doing graded homework is I would always like write down the dimensions and just like do this like little trick of mine of like looking at the insides match and then the result will be a two by one. Right, okay, so given how the arrows work, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna do like four times two plus two times one, three times two plus minus one times one, you get 10, five. And so the little trick here that you have to do to see if indeed V is an eigenvector is you have to try to factor out a scalar multiple such that your vector here actually looks like a 2, 1. So pretty straightforward. The scalar multiple is 5 because 5 times 2 is 10 and 5 times 1 is um, 5. So cool. we verified that v1 is indeed an eigenvector and that it has an eigenvalue of 5. So we were also supplied v2. So we can do the exact same procedure here um, where we get a vector of minus two and six and then we try to kind of rearrange it, factor some things out so that it looks like V2 and we do get that. And so this matrix has then two eigenvalues which are five and minus two and they have two eigenvectors. And you might also see in some textbooks or other references that there's another term here that's good to know. It's an eigenbasis. So an eigenbasis is just taking the eigenvectors and putting them in a matrix. That's all that is. So you can imagine just like putting these two side by side in a matrix and that's your eigenbasis. Hopefully so far so good. All right, so the thing I'm leaving out here is, well, okay, you gave us this matrix and you gave us these vectors, but like how does one actually find eigenvalues and eigenvectors? So that process is a lot more tedious. It's straightforward, but again, it's very tedious. Um, and you can find a step-by-step -step here and it will introduce some things that hopefully uh, you will remember like a characteristic equation and determinants and so on. 
And once you do a couple, maybe two or three, you'll get the hang of it. But again, it's error prone and it's better to maybe save this uh, for R or another programming language, unless of course you're a student and have to do it manually, then in that case, um, better to get some practice with pen and paper. But so with R, you can, you can do this. You can find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors for a matrix. So this, this does not necess necessitate a package. This comes with base R. So once you define your matrix, um, you can call on eigen M and it prints out a list of first the values, which are five and minus two. That's exactly what we found with pen and paper. So that's a nice confirmation. And then you get the factor. And you can also save the results of a list and just get what you need. Like if you're just interested in the eigenvalues, or you're just interested in the vectors. Um, a little disclaimer here for large matrices, it's better to avoid computing the eigenvectors because there could be a lot of them. Um, so when you call upon eigen, there's a nice little option here where you can just tease out the eigenvalues. Alright. So this might be the most exciting uh, part of this linear algebra overview is singular value decomposition. And this is an extremely powerful technique. In fact, it is behind many of the things that we might be using as data scientists. So one of them being dimensionality reduction techniques, so PCA. For those that might not be familiar with it, it's you basically use it when you have a lot of variables and you suspect that some might be correlated with one another and that's not necessarily a good thing to have when you're modeling. So a way to keep as much information as possible without losing it and with making your stuff smaller to put it that way, is to use PCA. Um, so that's very commonly used in many modeling techniques. Um, another cool one that I honestly didn't know is you can use this stuff for image compression and image recovery. So that's stuff that, I mean, exists like even on your phone. Um, and it can even also be used for facial recognition. And this blog post here goes through many other applications that secretly use this singular value decomposition. And recently I tweeted about this too. Like I, I think it was Daniela Witten. She's a statistician. She had a really interesting tweet thread going over the steps of singular value decomposition. And she's a statistician that's like years and years out of, you know, linear algebra 101. But it's such a powerful technique that, you know, it kind of stays with you throughout your entire career. And who knows, I'm, I'm just a data analyst slash scientist that does pretty quote unquote simple things for now. But, you know, maybe one day you'll end up working for Google or Uber or whichever um, and have to harness the power of SVDs for things like facial recognition, although please don't, it's been used for questionable purposes, but you know, things like image compression or optimization algorithms, so. Right, uh, with that being said, it is very tedious, but um, it's worth noting kind of, you know, the steps that you need to be doing to find the SVD for a matrix. So there's a couple steps here and you'll note that within a step there's multiple steps like that's how convoluted this procedure might be. 
But all in all, you know, pretty straightforward if you've gone through a semester of linear algebra. And I remember going through SVDs as like one of the last chapters because it used a lot of the techniques that we were learning throughout the semester. So first you compute the transpose of A and the transpose is just a fancy little term to mean the rows become columns. And you can do this pretty easy in R with just like calling T on a matrix, like literally T parentheses M and that's it, you get the transpose. And then you compute the transpose times A. And you find the eigenvalues of that product and you square them and that's what we call singular values, hence the name. Then you construct a diagonal matrix. A diagonal means there's like ones like along the diagonal and like zeros, I believe, everywhere else. By placing these singular values in descending order and compute the inverse of the matrix, which is just S to the power of minus one. And using those eigenvalues, you find the eigenvectors. You put these eigenvectors in a matrix V. So again, like the term eigenbasis, that's what that is. And then you compute that transpose. And then you compute this and then you verify your result to make sure that it's working properly. So again, SVD is this matrix decomposition into three other matrices. And this has really important properties that we won't delve into here, um, but nonetheless, pretty important. So we can do this in R, thankfully, because, or else this would probably take 20 minutes, uh, depending on the system that you have. So let's go see what that looks like. Or maybe before I show you how much time R can save, I should show you how it looks if you are doing this with like pen and paper. And this, this is funny because it's like a fast track tutorial. So they've like skipped some steps here. Um, so just, you can just see how long this, this process is. So I've lifted the steps from here in case you're curious and I'll link this in the slides too. So yeah, I think you, you get the idea. All right, so the way you do this in R is and this comes again with base, you don't have to download a package for it, is you define your matrix. And then all you gotta do is just wrap it in SVD. <laughs> and then you get a list, um, D, U, and V. You can double check these with what you found manually. So D actually corresponds to the S matrix here U corresponds to this one, and then V corresponds to this one. Cool. Um, so that's, that's my very quick um, overview of linear algebra. I think I've included just enough to get us up and going with the rest of the course. Um, I have some references here, uh, a mix of both textbooks. And if you want the textbook, I have a PDF version of it. So let me know, I can send it to you. Um, and honestly, the textbook is good because it goes through a lot of like proofs and definitions and theoretical things, but uh, honestly, you could get you could get up and going with linear algebra by just looking at um, articles and, and videos too. All right, um, I think something that could be fun actually is going through this blog post of all the 
cool applications of SVD. <laughs> the title is a bit clickbait, <laughs> but This is really cool. So SVD is used for things like image compression, as we've mentioned. And if you're so inclined, you can try it out in Python with an example. So they're saying here, oops. so they're saying here, this image is compressed. It, it does look a little different to me than the original image, but still pretty impressive. So image recovery as well. Not totally sure how this works, but I'd have to read it. Understand. And then eigenfaces. And this was like work done in 1991. So who knows what they're up to today. This is cool too. Oh, and k-means, that's another application I didn't delve into, but that's one as well. All right, let me, looks like there's a few chat messages. Uh, Tony, um, I can't. Your audio is um is not very clear. Uh, okay, have a have a now. No. Okay, I'll just type them out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hey, Asma, is, um, is, hey. solve, is solve just finding the inverse? Is what, sorry? Is the solve command in R, is that just finding like the inverse, the matrix inverse? I, I don't know, maybe. Let me see, I'm trying to find like a matrix and then it's inverse and then see if solve gives you the same thing. Did you try that by any chance before I look into uh, an example? Did not, no. Okay. Um, Tony, if SVD works with higher dimensions, I don't know, but, the, but it's something that can be easily tested if we supply the matrix. But yeah, never mind. I just looked at the, um, at the documentation. And yeah, if you don't provide B to that function, then yeah, it just returns the, um, the matrix inverse of A. Oh, okay.
So there's a stats exchange post that goes into SVD with like three dimensional array. So it seems, it seems possible, although I don't know how to set up a three dimensional array in R and then supply it to SVD. I don't know if it would work. Try to find like an R post. Yeah, Roman, that would be, that would be really cool, actually. We could either do it next session, given that everything is still sort of fresh, just like, I don't know how involved that process is, but if it takes um, <laughs> tan step PCA, <laughs> You yeah. know, it's, it's like so many other things I found where like you can run this crazy complex analysis in like three or four lines and that's not the hard part. The hard part is like developing the intuition um, and, and the interpretation. And so like I've run PCA a bunch of times, but I can't find a good, I haven't been able to find a good resource for how to interpret like the results of it, like the loading matrices or like the biplots stuff like that so mm -hmm. i'm not talking about like going through like the specific hardcore math of it but more around like a use like a practical use case and then how to interpret the results um, so that's what i had in mind yeah that would be that would be really cool roman if you want to spearhead that um oh god it's my to have that. That. no i only <laughs> said that because i've struggled with it so much in the past and like your your presentation is like brought a lot of those struggles back to life for me because uh, this <laughs> yeah. is something I wanted to get a handle on for so long, but I just like sidestepped it because I could never, like I don't have like a stats background or anything. And so stuff like this is a bit out of my wheelhouse, um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know, just more of a food for thought. I, I can't say I, I like could volunteer to present on something like that right now i would need to do a lot of like um research and refreshing but um, i just wanted to throw the idea out there yeah no roman it it would be it would be very valuable for someone to go through these steps and so if i'm understanding correctly you wouldn't go through like the math of it but you'd go through like an application that uses PCA and try to make sense of like the results. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, looks like Mike in the chat was already attempting to write a tutorial on PCA for R. Mike, feel free to speak up because I don't want to speak for you. But um. uh, yeah, so um, uh, definite imposter syndrome um, kicking in here, but. You know, I, I did try to, to really grasp the fundamentals of, uh, and pass along to grad students last semester. So I wrote a vignette, um, and I guess I understand about 80% of what I wrote. Uh, so um, as long as it's understood that um, I don't know entirely what I'm talking about, because I, I do approach all this stuff not from uh, a, a, a very deep math background, but more of a, uh, how does this machine work and how are the wires connected inside of it. So um, if you guys would be patient with it, uh, I do have something um, set up that um, we could go through next week. Um, and it is R based. Oh, great. Yeah, that'd be nice, Mike. And um, again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but you know, I think in the group, there might be just one statistician, which is Josh, <laughs> putting him on the spot a little bit.
but all of us are not, I, yeah, I think most of us are not classically trained in statistics. And so this is, yeah, this is why I wanted to start this book club is to talk about things together and hopefully figure them out together. So anything that you have, like, we'd be glad to see and um, we could build on it as a group too. Yeah. So even if it's unfinished, that's, that's okay. Michael, let me know what kind of sharing you like. So I okay. Can, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's that, that's actually wait. Actually, I I, I should be doing PCA and beer, shouldn't I? Huh. Um, and one of the things that oh penguins. Okay, okay. Oh, but um, penguins has um. I don't think it has a lot of variables. So maybe something with a lot more than that might be a good use case for PCA. Something that has a lot okay. of just messy multi-collinearity in it, um, that might be cool. Although I wouldn't know a data set. But I'm, I'm sure tutorials already use like data sets that have that, right? So maybe just copy and put a tutorial. Penguins yeah, since I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, so I'm in, I, I work in, in omics. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, genomics, transcript omics and uh, so there are data sets, in the, when I wrote the thing, it was based on analyzing biological data. Um, I'll see if that is friendly to the group or if maybe I, I can customize it for something that's a little bit more approachable. Okay, and Tony, I don't know if you're being serious or just joking around, but it seems like penguins raw has lots of variables. Oh, oh, this is something for the rest of the group that wasn't here in the first session last week. So we've committed to using the Palmer Penguins data set for any concepts in the book that we want to illustrate with real, well, real data. Um, so if you're not familiar with that data set, because it's kind of relatively new, um, it is available on CRAN and you can download it and check it out. Very user-friendly and I think a really good alternative to the IRIS data set. And it lends itself nicely to kind of like the biomed applications because it has some stuff about penguin physiology and, and so on. All right, cool. Um, guys, can I ask you a favor and just post these links also in Slack because once we end the meeting, everything gets lost, if you wouldn't mind. Um, but I can certainly do so after the meeting ends because I get all the chat history, including your private discussion. Just kidding. I don't get your private discussion. But that was something like when Zoom was first starting in the pandemic, like everyone was freaking out about. <laughs> all right. So with that being said, football is on, and I think we can catch the last quarter or so. Um, so good night. Thank you for coming. Bye. Good night. Thanks, oh, see you next Thanks. And see you next week for probability overview. That one is very, 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 very important. Way more important than linear algebra, I think. So bye. <laughs>